In this video, we're going to embrace our inner amateur psychologist that we all have going on most of the time and try and peer into the souls and the minds of, of the, the people who create these different media artifacts that we're going to be examining. So um, we're going to do that in this video by learning about the critical lens of psychoanalytic analysis. So um, to preface this, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, well, well, we're going to be looking at some areas that aren't really accepted in uh, modern psychology. So just be aware of that. But um, what we're going to be looking at in psychoanalytic analysis uh, is, is trying to examine artifacts using a framework of psychoanalysis, primarily rooted in the theories of psychology and, and psychological development developed by Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. Now, again, these are largely not used in psycho in current psychology and, and, and psychiatry um, the the specific um, uh, theories developed by especially Sigmund Freud have been kind of discarded by many many um, professionals so just be aware of that but we're going to use this mostly as a again an intellectual framework for examining some of these things and, and trying to get into the minds of some of the people who are creating things so let's take a look at some of the Freudian basics which again to just to uh, protect myself from from psychologists everywhere and psychiatrists everywhere these are not widely accepted anymore but um, but what psychoanalytic analysis is based in is freudian uh, psychology so let's take a look at the basics here freud said that uh, behavior was driven by the unconscious that that we have these drives that are even below our conscious levels of thought and feeling and and that we have but we have these drives that are just inherent in the human beings most of them are sexual and uh, so according to freud freud was kind of uh, you know he thought everybody was obsessed with sex and i think really what we found out is that probably freud was obsessed with sex and so a lot of these drives are are are, are uh, that we are driven by our sexual um, desires and lust without even being consciously aware of it um, that these behaviors that are largely developed by childhood events uh, they stem from relationships with our parents so for um, for for young boys it's jealousy of their fathers and a desire for their mothers and for young girls it's uh, jealousy of their mother and not being able to have their father because he's already taken of course by their mother so um and it's driven by these kind of relationships though these complicated relationships that we have with our with our parents and these physiological fixations that we have which surprise with freud are largely to do with our sexual reproductive organs so we're, we're and 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 uh, not only but our, you know just our our uh, swimsuit areas right what we would what we'd politely in a g-rated world call call our swimsuit areas our physiolog physiological fixations with those types of things so um then as a result we create these defenses to keep these conflicts buried that our mind then creates these defenses uh, such as selective memory selective perception denial projection um, various fears like intimacy and death and things like that, that these are all then defenses created to keep those conflicts buried, those those conflicts that we have that result from those drives that we have and those uh, childhood events that have scarred us and created all these conflicts. We create these defenses um, to keep those things buried. Okay. And then Freud said that there are basically three areas that vie for dominance as a result. Um, the id, the ego, and the superego. The id is the location of our drives, those behaviors that we develop, right? And the ego is the location of the defenses that we develop, right? selective memory, selective uh, perception, fears, things like that. That's, that's all in the ego. And then the superego is the location of the judgment of self and others. So that's kind of the... The, the the morality that we have in there the balancing between those things that we the, the the way we use judgment to to manage those things the id and the ego uh, rests in the super ego so we can think of it like having an angel and, and a devil on each shoulder right that if we have the angel of of uh, the the on, on one side the super ego is balancing those things or you know to take it further with the simpsons uh characterizations here bart would be the id he's all drive right he's all he's pursu he's pursuing all of those drives uh homer is the ego so he's all those defensives he defenses and uh so all those things that we've created to push those drives down are represented in homer and then lisa is the super ego because she's the moral center she's she's the solid judgment that keeps those things in check 
essentially. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, all of this influences our adult behavior. So all of that stems from childhood, all that develops in childhood and starts in childhood and then influences our adult behaviors as we get older okay? and, and presents itself differently as we get older. So that's the basics of Freudian psychology and the Freudian um, method of psychology and, and, and theories of psychology. And how that affects psychoanalytic analysis is this. These are the major premises of psychoanalytic analysis. Analysis then. Um, first of all, these unconscious childhood conflicts influence our adult behavior. As Freud said, they, they manifest themselves in different ways, but they come out in us as adults. And that's when we start creating things and have the power to create things. So this shows through then in what we create. So the things that we create are really, according to, in, as we're examining it in psychoanalytic analysis, the things that we create are really manifestations of our drives and our defenses and our super ego, the way that we manage those things. And all of that can be seen through the things that are created. So when we're looking at an artifact, um, we ought to be trying to look at these psychological uh, attributes of the creator of the audience, the perceived audience that that artifact was created for and the examiner, the person who's conducting this uh, analysis, because all of these things offer insight into an artifact. So we have to examine the psychological attributes, of all of those things right, of the creator of the audience and of really ourselves as an analyzer and, uh, and an examiner when we're doing psychoanalytic uh, analysis. Sounds simple enough, right? Uh, this sounded a lot more fun when we were using cartoons to describe things, I'm sure. But here are some of the common questions that come up in psychoanalytic analysis. First of all, how do the operations of repression structure or inform the work? So remember, we have those, those things of, uh, of repression, right? So how do the operations of that repression structure or inform the work? So uh, what Oedipal or other family dynamics are present? So Oedipus, the Oedipus complex is um, the, the, the idea that um, young, young boys are obsessed with their mothers and, and really want to, um, and, you know, I don't know how to do this, it's presumably an adult audience here. So uh, the young boys want to have sex with their mothers. That's the Oedipus complex, that they have become obsessed with their mothers, that they want to that really marry their moms. They want, they want to create relationships with their moms in that way. That's the Oedipus complex. So are there Oedipal complex? Is there an Oedipal complex then that is represented in the, the adult uh, creation of this artifact or other fi family dynamics that we, that you would find in those kind of Freudian um, things. So um, uh, is there, you know, a fear of fascination with death, um, with sexuality, uh, including love and romance as well as sexual behavior? Um, is there a, uh, and then, so what do, are, do those represent the primary psychological identity of the creator or of the audience or of um, the, the, the examiner uh, or the operations of the id and the ego and the superego, right? Those types of things. Um, what dynamics are present? Uh, how can characters, uh, behavior, narrative events, and or images be explained in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? So depending on what kind of artifact you're looking at. A character, obviously, if it's a novel or if it's a TV show or movie or something like that, uh, we could look at this from that, that perspective of the character and their behavior or the narrative events, the way that things unfold in there or the image. If it's a, if it's a work of art, you know, if it's a painting or a sculpture or uh, something like that, then we can look at any images that are involved there and what they represent. Um, and do they represent any kind of psychoanalytic concepts? Uh, what does the work suggest about the psychological being of its author? So the, just the general psychological state of the author. What might a given interpretation of an artifact suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner? So again, you as the person who is examining this artifact, um, what does that tell us about your psychological motives? And is that influencing your interpretation in some way? And are there prominent words or images present um, that could have different or hidden meanings. Is there, is there some subtext? Is there a double entendre here? And could there be some conscious reason for the author using these um, problem words or images or avoiding other problem words or images and substituting others in for those? So I have selected an artifact to examine using psychoanalytic analysis. And uh, at this point, the song is from 
a couple of years ago, but uh, I think it's still an appropriate artifact and a good one to examine. So uh, we're going to take a look at it. I'm not really a huge fan of this artist or the song or whatever, but it's it's a good representative artifact. So we're going to take a look at Watermelon Sugar by Harry Styles. If you're not familiar with the song, you can look up the uh, the video on YouTube and check it out so you can get an idea of the imagery and the things, although you can see the uh, the, the, the cover here from the single. But uh, um, So you can watch that video on your own if you wish. Pause this one and go watch it. But that's what we're going to examine. I did go look at the video. I'm not, again, not super familiar with uh, Harry Styles or his music or whatever. Uh, I know a little bit of his backstory, but, uh, but I thought this was a good song and, and representative just based on um, what we find, what we know about it from the, the just popular culture, popular rumor at that time. So anyway, um, let's take a look at it. So the first common question that we ask in psychoanalytic analysis uh, that we're going to check out here is how do the operations of repression structure or inform the work? So uh, in this particular instance, sexuality is prominent in all areas of the the song and the the video and it, so it's it's in the it's present in the lyrics in the instrumentation in the Im imagery in the the video and the way that it was promoted uh, i mean it's just it's just all over the place here um that the sexuality is just smothering this this song this video and this uh, this this piece of work so that part of the repression is is uh, is is there and informs the work of course just sexuality in general um, what Oedipal or other family dynamics are present? Uh, there's an aspect here of pleasing a maternal figure, I guess. Um, uh, perhaps even guilt for paternal or patriarchal dominance, maybe. Uh, I, and, you know, could be reading into that. But basically, we know this. I mean, the song Watermelon Sugar is famously about um, oral sex, basically. So um, th that it's representative of that. So there's some act, uh, you know, some aspect of trying to please a maternal figure, please a, a woman who could, in Freud's mind, would have been a substitute for his mother and, and just, uh, so, you know, all women would be substitutes for your mother. Um, so, uh, how can a character's behavior, narrative events, or images be explained in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? There's certainly a level of fantasy at work here. There's no question. If you watch the video and see the imagery there, there's no uh, question that there's a, a level of fantasy at work there. Um, Superego may be in play as well with euphemism and uh, substitution of the words watermelon, watermelon sugar for uh, other things. Uh, that that, uh, that that he was referring to uh, in this song, um, supposedly. I, I think it's a fairly well-known little rumor, but it's a fairly well-known rumor. So, uh, but there's a level of fantasy at work there, and super ego in play with that substitution of words for um, others, filling in for uh, aspects of oral sex and things. Uh, what does the work suggest about the psychological being of its author? I think certainly that there's a drive, that there's a certainly a strong drive, sexual drive there, a desire to please, maybe even with that, uh, with that emphasis on oral sex and uh, to be seen as, as helpful or selfless, um, to be seen as somebody who is driven to please, but uh, certainly also a sexual desire there as well, sexual drive. And what might a given interpretation of an artifact suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner? Um, certainly, I think there's, you know, just from watching this video, you can probably tell that I'm more repressed or more buttoned up in my view of sexuality in a public forum than Harry Styles is probably. So, I mean, just the, the, the stiffness with which I am talking about this subject is probably evident that I'm more conservative, more repressed, more buttoned up, I guess. So we, you could interpret that, I think, in terms of my motives or my psychological motives uh, in examining this. Are there prominent words in the piece that could have different or hidden meanings? Uh, yeah. Uh, the title, uh, obviously, is the first giveaway. There's lots of skin in the video. The prominent placement of watermelon on the table in the video and in the promotional materials uh, is all over the place and it's representative, again, of an aspect of oral sex so there's you know um, yes there are lots of substitutions here things that have thinly veiled hidden meanings i think um, and could there be a subconscious reason for the author using these problem words yeah maybe trying to to seek acceptance but uh, as, as you know taking on an adult topic so to speak but maybe still trying to hold on to that younger fan base from um, when he was in One Direction, uh, and by, so using euphemism to kind of straddle those two worlds, uh, to say, 
hey, I'm an adult, I'm, I'm a sexual being and so forth, but I'm also aware that my fans may be a little younger uh, and a little too young for me to be too explicit with this at this time. So maybe using those um, in an effort to, and again, straddle both of those worlds and, and have the best of both worlds appeal to a whole uh, audience as possible. Okay, well, as uncomfortable as that was for me, and maybe for you, I hope it did give you an idea of what it's like to use psychoanalytic analysis on an artifact and uh, and provided some insight there. So, um, And that you, in general, now have more of an understanding of what psychoanalytic analysis is and how it can be used. If you have questions about psychoanalytic analysis or any of the other critical lenses that we, we are using to examine uh, critical media studies, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope you have, again, like I say, a better understanding of this unique critical lens and how it might be helpful to somebody examining these uh, different media artifacts.